This year, the world has lost more music artists than ever before. And no loss is felt more in the country music community than that of the great Merle Haggard. For most of the country music singers today, Merle Haggard defines country. They listened to his music, mimicked his writing and singing style, and hoped that one of their songs might one day be compared to the hag. Greatness like this doesn't come along very often. Here at Country's Family Reunion, we believe in bringing honor to whom honor is due. And setting aside a time to remember Merle Haggard is at the top of that list. Merle had agreed to be on this series, but sadly went home on his 79th birthday. This series is our tribute to him. All three of his sons are here, as well as a ton of his friends and fellow artists, and hosted by Whispering Bill Anderson. Together, they remember Merle Haggard as he really was. A father, a friend, a great songwriter, and of course, one of the biggest legends in country music history. Welcome to Country's Family Reunion Tribute to Merle Haggard. special country's family reunion as we pay tribute to the life and the music and the man, Mr. Merle Haggard, who had planned to be here with us for this special tribute, and the good Lord had other plans and called Merle home on his 79th birthday in April of 2016. But we're gathered here to sing his songs and, uh, and sing his praises and visit with people who knew him and loved him and worked with him and people even closer than that, his three sons, Marty Haggard, Noel Haggard, and Ben Haggard here to help not only talk about the, the music, but the man as well. Our good friend Eddie Stubbs told me something. Uh, at the Grand Ole Opry the other night, knowing that we were going to have this get-together and this reunion. Eddie did one of the last interviews that was ever done with Merle Haggard. And he asked Merle on that interview as it was wrapping up, he said, Merle, how do you want to be remembered? And Merle said, I just hope I'm remembered. Wow. And we're here to remember oh, yeah. today. And to start us off musically, 91 years young yesterday, the great Mac Wiseman, one of the last people to ever record with Merle Haggard. That Thank must you. have been quite an experience to make a record with him. Oh, it was indeed. Uh, he called me and uh, wondered if I was interested in when he was here to play the rhyme. And, and it took me about 30 seconds to say yes, of course. <laughs> And I assumed that he would want to do primarily his songs, which I was in favor of because he has so many good ones. But he insisted on doing uh, five of mine and five of his. So we just had a wonderful reunion, sang on each other's. And it was just a, a memorable occasion I'll never forget. The song that you're going to do today, is this one that was on the album or is on no, the album? No, we, we thought about doing this one, but we got around to doing some others. But... Uh, this is one of my favorites, so I was hoping I could do it today. Well, I can't think of anybody better to start off this particular program than Mac Wiseman singing this great Merle Haggard tune called Sing Me Back Home, the great Mac Wiseman, ladies and gentlemen. The warden led a prisoner down the hallway to his doom I stood up to say goodbye like on the red and I heard him tell the warden just before he reached my cell let my guitar Play, friend, do my request. Let him sing me back home. 
with a song I used to hear Make my old memories come alive Take me away And turn back the years Send me back home Before I die I recall last Sunday morning A choir from Crawl the street came to sing a few old gospel songs and I heard him tell the singers that song my mama sang can I hear it once more Before we move along Sing me back home The song my mama sang Make my old memories Come alive Day Turn back the years Sing me back home Before I die Great job, Matt. Thank you, sir. That is terrific. Did you ever tour with Merle? Tour with him? Mm -hmm. No, I didn't. I knew him uh, back in 57 when I was producing records for Dot out in Hollywood. We went up to uh, Bakersfield and recorded Bobby Bear uh, all night up at the... Uh, yeah. And uh, he was with uh, Lewis Talley and Fuzzy Owens. And... Uh, he was quite shy, I remember, but I enjoyed meeting him, and uh, he, was, he was friendly enough, but he was quite yet diverted. But uh, we had a wonderful time uh, visiting then and uh, a number of other times. When I was in Branson, uh, he was there filling in when Willie Nelson had to be out of town, and he came by one morning and uh, picked me up in his pickup truck. We went and had breakfast, and. He asked if I'd go out at his house and visit with his uh, two new youngsters and his wife, and we did. We had a wonderful visit out there. Bill was just about uh, this high at that time. <laughs> but he was having a good time. I have only good memories. I went out there really to put the uh, arm on Merle to let me be an opening act for him. But after I watched him a couple of nights, I told him, I said, you don't need no, no, no opening act. Uh, that was my job, thank you. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. So I had the first morning show in Branson. I did a morning show at 10 o'clock and uh, then uh, just hung around the rest of the time. I was on the road a lot. My calendar was full the whole year because I didn't know I was going out there until later in the season, you know. But he was just that kind of a fellow. We uh, tell a little story here that I hope everybody won't mind. Uh, he was in town recording one time, and uh, I went out to the recording studio because I didn't know him that well other than just being acquainted with him. But I knew Lewis and, and Fuzzy real well, and I took a pint of moonshine whiskey. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lewis and Fuzz really liked that. And Merle took a break on his session and came out with his little dog under his arm, and he took a sip out of it, you know. And 
which he was friendly, but uh, concentrating on this session, I'm sure. But a few nights later, I was just taking my shoes off and fixing to go to bed, and his phone rang, and it was Merle. He said, uh, I've let all my band go back, fly back to California. I got to drive that bus all the way back by myself. He said, you got any more of that sipping stuff you had? <laughs> So I got up and took him a pint of that moonshine down to the motel. <laughs> and he poured it in the gas tank, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he put it in the gas tank. <laughs> I mentioned when we first started that uh, the original plan was Merle was going to be here today. And I was telling yeah. Noel and Ben and Marty, I, I said, before we started, I said, your dad was going to be here yeah. today. And Noel said something very profound. You said, you looked around and you said, he is here. Oh. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed so. He's all over the place. Yeah. 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 He really is. I hope so. Marty, you're the oldest of the sons. What, what's your earliest memory of your dad? <laughs> I don't know if I can tell that one. <laughs> <laughs> he was married to my mama and it wasn't the best of relationships. Um, you know what, brother? Um, there's too many. Um, it's like a, it's like a, a movie running full, you know, too fast to watch in my head. When did you realize he was Merle Haggard, the star, and not just Daddy? I never did. Uh, I know that sounds silly. I, obviously, I knew. You got to understand something. Merle Haggard never has existed to me. Okay. Um, it's all this music is great. But as good as you think it is, you ought to hear it through my ears. Um, he's my dad. Um, Merle Haggard's an outsider's perspective. And that don't, it would be like Jesus and the Father. He don't see God, he sees his Father. And I see my dad. And um, his music is the least important thing he ever brought into this world. You're looking at at least three of them, okay? These, these, this is the best work he's ever done right here. <laughs> 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 No strutting back there. <laughs> I'm doing Barney Five. <laughs> what, do you echo what, what Marty says? About uh, my, not being Merle, but oh, just being uh, Yeah, I remember um, I stowed away underneath the bus. I got tired of the uh, looking at the taillights pull out. So I stowed away under the bus, and that's when I remember he was Merle Haggard. <laughs> mm. Got under the bus. Yeah, I got. Yeah, I got in, in. You know, the cargo place. You got tired of watching. We got there about three hundred miles down the road, and uh, I popped out, and he said, "Well, give him a job." You know, so I <laughs> put you to work. <laughs> passed out programs. Yeah. yeah. How old were you at that point? I was about eleven. Wow. Yeah. He's a stowaway. <laughs> yeah. You ain't, ain't leaving me no more, brother. I'm, I'm going with you. <laughs> ben, being the youngest, um, you. Maybe had a have a different perspective. You you joined the band and played as a part of the Strangers for how many years now? Uh, it was eight years, I believe. Yeah, eight years started when I was fifteen. I'm twenty three, twenty two. Uh, all that I have heard <laughs> forever about Ben Haggard is that you are a fantastic guitar player. Did your dad teach you to play guitar? Well, I didn't really let him hear me until I <laughs> did you went on stage you know my mom she uh she said you need to listen to Ben you know and I'd be out in the garage playing and I never thought of anything that I'd be good enough to get out on stage with him you know and uh and he uh, finally heard me and he's like god dang you know he and called he was, me one day Ben he said he had like a tear in his voice he said, I can't say the words he said Benny's playing his off is what he said, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, he said, I'm serious. You need to listen to him. So hey. you, you joined the band. At some point in, in all of your lives, you, you, were you part of the strange? I know you were on the road with him and on the stage with him. I, yeah. I were was you ever, him. like, part of the strangers? I was. I was in, when Leona and him, when Leona left him, um, <laughs> the, the third one to leave him at, at that time, um, it was in 1982. It was just, be maybe 83, because... That's where love goes. Um, I was doing concessions with Dad. I was his partner in that thing, and Leona had left, and I happened to be walking by the front of the stage, and up, up to that point, I'd always done my own thing, but Dad said, hey, Marty, get up here, grab your guitar, I need to sing harmony and play rhythm for me tonight. He said, he said Leona left me. I said, I don't sing harmony, Dad. 
He said, just get up here. We get home. We'll, I'll get somebody else. That was two years later. I was still up there. <laughs> <laughs> Not singing harmony. No. <laughs> but it was, it was a great, it was a, Ronnie, you know the band, you know, it was Tiny and Tiny Moore, and it, it was a 13-piece band. It was probably the best band I've ever heard in my life. And I sat on the very Hell end. Shamling. Yeah. But I sat on the very end with Tiny, and um, musically speaking, that was probably the funnest period of my life. But yeah, Dad, I think that's what Willie said, that Dad, Dad and Willie, um, the one thing they had in common was all their boys had played in his band. <laughs> yeah. I'm the only one that got text fired, though. <laughs> that got what? Text, text fired. He got fired by oh. text. <laughs> Didn't even get a call. And I said, wait, Merle don't know how to text. <laughs> You mean your father fired you with a text message? His wife, his mom, fired oh. me through a text. <laughs> That's the but well, you were hired two days later, right? He, he told me not to do something. I did it anyway. And he, uh, he gave me a little time off and then hired me back. So. <laughs> was he a strict, was he a disciplinarian? Did no, he? he just didn't want anybody. You know, he was out there paying you good money to do the right thing, you know, help him and, and, and do the thing. And, he didn't, he didn't want you to do what he did, you know. <laughs> tight shift. Yeah. Yeah, he, did, knows he, I loved yeah. and he just didn't want you messing up. He, he was trying to help you, you know. So. Yeah. Did he, being on the stage, would he correct you and, and tell you certain things to do or not to do? Oh, yeah. You know, right when I uh, started, when I was 15 and about as nervous as I can get, <laughs> he, would, he would tell me when I did something wrong. He made me, made me kick off strangers. Four different times one night. <laughs> because Here's I didn't get it right, you know? And uh, Yeah, he, he made me do that, and that was about as nerve-wracking as it can be. <laughs> Benny was driving the bus when he was, what, 15, seven, 15 years old, and, and, uh, and I think right after that, he quit because Dad came up and chewed him out, and he said, I don't want to do that no more. You know, but, yeah, I retired early. Yeah. Ronnie Reno, you knew Merle for a lot of years. I want to mention what Eddie Stubbs told me. Of course, your dad was the great Don Reno, banjo great and bluegrass legend. Eddie Stubbs told me that when Merle was in prison, that there was a disc jockey there in the, that little prison radio station. Yeah. And that Merle fell in love with your dad, Reno and Smiley, with their record of Sweethearts in Heaven. And that that was one of the things that influenced him to want to sing country music. Oh, yeah. And he loved Mac Wiseman, too. That's where he heard Mac, I think, up there. And, uh, and I produced that Sweet Arts in Heaven. Yeah, God. Mac did. Oh, that's right. That is yeah. when you were with Dot Records, isn't it? It's, it's a small world to be so big. But, uh, yeah, Merle loved, uh, he loved bluegrass. He really did. And I didn't know his history in bluegrass until I had met him and been around him. We used to uh, open his shows with, I was with Bob and Sonny, the Osborne brothers, and we started opening Merle's shows for him, and, and that's the way I got to meet him, got to know him, and uh, he just, uh, we, I mean, he could, he'd tear up uh, Molly and Tim Brooks on the fiddle, just, I mean, he loved it, he really did, and. Uh, did he ever cut a bluegrass album? He, he did, he did. I did one on him um, called the Bluegrass Sessions uh, back in 2007, I believe, and of course, it, you know, it's, it's how do you get Merle Haggard to do a bluegrass album? Uh, so actually, we just used the bluegrass uh, musicians and, and let Merle be Merle and sort of do it the way he wanted to do it. And so, <laughs> you know, so that's all you can do. Well, uh, and it turned out great. We had a, also, we've had, oh, Ben Isaacs uh, played bass on it. And of course, uh, Sonia and Becky sang on a bunch of the things that we've done acoustically. And uh, so, yeah, he could he could do it all. Is it hanging on the wall here somewhere with all these albums? I numbers? don't see it. Um, I see a lot of the albums I was on on here. I think I started with Merle with If We Make It Through December, and then I was on his 30th, and from his 30th on for about eight years. Okay, now playing, singing, or both? Both, yeah. I would uh, do all the harmony with Merle and then play acoustic guitar with him. And, and, and you toured with him for... Uh, almost eight years, yeah. eight years, yeah. In fact, I had uh, I had Noel's job when Noel was 11. <laughs> of crawling up under the bus? No, no, no. <laughs> I tell you what, now I do remember a lot of things happened when he left Bakersfield. There was a cat one time out there on the ranch that crawled in one of the bays before Noel did. That was my, you know, that was my kitty. <laughs> maybe that's what Noel was looking for. Anyway, we, that, we didn't know the cat was on there. And of course, the buses didn't stop till they got to Nashville. 
And when we stopped in Nashville, we heard something going on in there and opened the door and this cat ran out and we have never seen that cat <laughs> again. You know, it almost happened to me. I got out and I almost was never seen it again. <laughs> do a Merle Haggard song. Oh, sure, sure. You made a, uh, I'm gonna come up there and do it, I guess. It's where we rehearsed it, so I'll run up there and do it. I'm coming. Here I go, here I go. Of course, the people that watch Country's Family Reunion, Ronnie Reno is no stranger because he has the, the bluegrass show on the RFD network. You still doing those? I am. I sure am, Bill. Yeah, and uh, hats off to RFD for sure, you bet. But, uh, and uh, actually, I was on this record, so um, honored, very honored to do it. Honky Tonk Nighttime Man. heart starts beating when the sun starts sinking low My heart starts beating when the sun starts sinking low But when the shadows fall I know it's time for me to go hey, Get my rest in the daytime Do my run, run, running around at night sun goes down I'm gonna tuck my blues away Yeah, I'm a honky-tonk nighttime man I can't stand no lie Yeah, I'm a honky-tonk nighttime man I can't stand no lie I get my in the daytime Do my run, run, running around at night Thank you, Ronnie. That's a pretty good little bluegrass band you got picking with you back there, ain't they? Yeah. I forgot yeah, where yeah. I was, they're so good. <laughs> <laughs> David Frizzell, you're yes. way back there behind I'm, me. I I'm hardly sneak, see you back sneaking there. Sneaking up behind you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Your brother, Lefty oh. Frizzell, of course, was a gigantic influence on Merle Haggard. On Talk everybody about I know. <laughs> well, yeah, he was he an influence. Sure. And this guy. <laughs> <laughs> 
But you know, yeah, exactly. Lefty was the one that that brought Jimmy Rogers into the into the play. Also, back in those days. And uh, matter of fact, I remember being on the road with Lefty back in oh fifty five, fifty six, when I was about five years old, you know, something like that. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and we'd get to we get to the motel or something a day, day or two early, and Lefty wouldn't let anybody know he was in town. You know, he, he wouldn't do that. And Lefty get the guitar out, and 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 he would just just him just. And he'd play Jimmy Rogers. So I had lessons with Jimmy Rogers. And uh, when I was just a kid growing up, and then, and then I started opening shows with him and stuff like that. And, but everybody that I knew was turned on to Lefty, you know. And, and, and Lefty, was, Lefty was turned on to Jimmy. In other words, Jimmy Rogers was Lefty's influence. Exactly, yeah. And then Lefty became the influence to, yeah. to generations, exactly. including Merle Haggard. Exactly. Do you remember, were there times when Lefty and Merle worked shows together? You know, back, back when I... Back when I was starting with him, he just—he had just met Merle, and Merle was, I think, 16 years old, and came to the old Rainbow Gardens, I think it was, in uh, in Bakersfield, California. And uh, Lefty, there was, there was a one of the the club owner, I think, said, or one of the guys said that there was a guy here. There's a boy out here that sings just like you. And Lefty said, "Really?" He said, "Why would he want to do that?" <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you he said, "You got." It. <laughs> You got to, you got to meet him. You got to meet him. He said, so let's, well, yeah, we'll bring him. So, so Merle came in. He was 16 years old. You know the story probably better than I do. And, um, and so he's, he got Lefty. Lefty gave him guitar, his guitar. And, uh, and he sang for him right there. And Lefty said, well, and the club owner came in. So let's just time to go. He said, I'm going to go on right after the kid. <laughs> I'll go on right after the kid. And the, guy, the club owner says, no, now let's say 2,000 people out here. They came out here just to see Lefty. He said, I'm going to go on just right after the kid. <laughs> so he put Merle on the So the, the kid stage. went out and took oh, Lefty's guitar. Sing, I said, yeah, let that boy sing. He let that boy sing. I think Roy Nichols was in that band. Yeah. Was Roy he? Nichols was yes. playing for Lefty on, that, on yes. that show. I didn't even know that Roy Nichols was on some of those early uh, recordings of Lefty's, yes. but he was. I think that's where my dad met Roy for the first time. And, yeah, uh, yeah. small world, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, he was, he was, the, he was just incredible. Yeah. I remember Wynn Stewart, remember Wynn Stewart and everybody out there together. And uh, but Lefty was the was the one we all kind of was listening to, and uh, and uh, uh, a lot of things happened that particular night that he met Merle, and right after that, a lot of different people that was there uh, was turned on by country music that night. As a matter of fact, I think uh, Merle has said that when he got the guitar, Lefty's guitar, and he sang, he said, "I knew exactly what I was going to do from then on." He said, "That was it." Mm -hmm. that, he said, "I was hooked." <laughs> you know, you're talking about Wynn Stewart. I believe uh, it was in Nevada there, Earl went to a win, and he asked him, he said, if you could help a guy's career, make him a star, would you do it? He said, sure. He said, can I have sing me a sad song? <laughs> he said, yeah. And that was his first, you know. Yeah, first and, and Wynn gave it to him. Yeah, gave yeah, it to him. Yeah. yeah. Merle was quoted as, as saying that he thought Wynn Stewart was the best nightclub entertainer that he ever saw. He played bass in Wynn's band for yeah. a long time. He that's, did. That's how he started there. And Roy, I believe Roy was in that band. Um, and I believe Wynn didn't show up or, or was late or something, so Merle, they put him up front, and that's, you know. Next night, Wynn was playing for Merle. Yeah, well, Merle was playing <laughs> bass. Yeah, you know, I, I, exactly. It's kind of like Tommy Collins opening. Tommy Collins for Elvis, uh, yeah. Leonard um, used to close the show for Elvis. They went out on that tour. By the time they got back, Elvis was closing the show. Oh, That's yeah. kind of that kind of a thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Somebody had just entered the building here. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's Merle Haggard stories all over this, this room, so anybody that thinks of something they want to add, please jump in because everybody in here has got, got Merle Haggard stories. I got one, working Bill. With him. Go ahead. I got one. We were invited to, uh, Merle was invited to a party one time over at Billy Sherrill's house, and... Uh, Robert Redford was in town, and there was something going on with him, and I think uh, Willie Nelson was invited, uh, Charlie Daniels was invited, um, Waylon Jennings was, was invited, Merle was invited, and he wanted me to go with him, so I went with him. And on the way over there, uh, it was at Billy Sherrill's house, and uh, as, you know, normal musician stuff, we sort of got just a little messed up on going over there, messed up, and so, we pulled in there, and Merle wasn't exactly sure which house that Billy lived in. So we just pulled up in front of this house, and Merle said, I think this is it. 
We just got out and went in. <laughs> and it wasn't Billy's house. <laughs> it was uh, some lady met us in there, and she said, can I help you? And Merle said, well, we're looking for Billy Sherrill for the party. She said, oh, he's the fourth house down on the left. <laughs> <laughs> So we actually went over and had a wonderful time that day with the, with everybody who was over there. The guy sitting behind you in the bright blue shirt, Buddy Cannon, you produced the last two records, didn't you, that Merle recorded? Uh, the last two full albums, yeah. I did, uh, I did a record with him and Willie Nelson about a year and a half ago, uh, which uh, was uh, it debuted at number one on the country album charts and that's the first time Merle had had a number one album in, uh, since the 80s I think and uh, man it was uh, when I got the call to do that project I mean I've been working with Willie quite a bit over the years so he and I got got our comfort zone down but I thought Merle Haggard holy crap am I going to do this you know <laughs> but uh, you know once we got in there and uh, and uh, and the wheel started turning. It was, it was pretty awesome. Mike was on those sessions with me down in Austin, and uh, it was it was just amazing. Uh, Merle had just written this song called uh, "Missing Old Johnny Cash," and it was sort of a recitation kind of thing without a real melody. He just really had the lyric, I guess, you know, and. Uh, it was fun to see all the pickers gathered around him and Merle's creative wheels start turning. And in a matter of about 10 minutes, that song just blossomed into a thing, you know, and it, it was just awesome. And it was really, uh, you know, getting to see the Merle Haggard studio genius at work, you know. When you produce somebody like Merle Haggard, you don't stand there and tell him how to sing, do you? Heck no. <laughs> that's not, you know, that's not, that's not really the way I work anyway, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, when we, uh, after we finished the duet record up, he, uh, he, Merle called me up uh, and he said, hey, he said, I, I enjoyed doing that. Let's, let's make a solo album, you know, so we uh, started passing some songs back and forth and, um uh, uh, he wrote some new stuff, you know, and uh, over the course of last year, about from, I'd say, February or March to November, uh, I was in, in and out of the studio with Merle working on that project, and he, uh, we, we got his vocals all finished up just before he, he got so sick there at the end, and Got the album. Uh, the album's mixed, and uh, you know I'm sure somewhere down the road it'll 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 come out. It's really a good record. I'm I couldn't be prouder of it. You know. Oh, so there's a Merle Haggard album that we've never heard. It's new. Yeah, we wow. just had finished it up. Uh, when we started cutting uh, on the stuff, he told me he said, "Hey, call uh, call old Vince Gill up and uh, and see if he'll sing some harmony on here with me." Vince and Sonia Isaacs. He said both of them are in the room today. Wow. He said, I, I'd love to have them on it and call Vince. He said, I'll sing on the whole album. <laughs> you know, ended up on four or five cuts, uh, him and Sonia. Talk about that, Vince. Talk about the experience. Well, it was a dream come true. You know, um, I got to sing on one thing that he did with Mac. Um, and, you know, just if I have a favorite in, in life, it was him. And so the best part was to be... When you're in the studio and you get under the cans, you get under the headphones, you really hear, you know, and just, uh, I knew every note of, of all of his music, you know, and, and uh, it was imperative that it, it was the best I could possibly be because it meant so much. <laughs> 